Behold the first public comment on behalf of the Trump campaign chairman on the day that the Trump campaign chairman was hit with a 12 count felony indictment. Behold. Well, I think you all saw it today that President Donald Trump was correct. <laughs> Of course he was. Of course that's what the indictment says to all of us. Fishing for a presidential pardon was not the worst way for Paul Manafort's lawyer to start his first public remarks today. But whether or not Paul Manafort ends up getting one may hinge on whether the president looks at Paul Manafort's own legal trouble and sees liability for himself, either in what Paul Manafort is alleged to have done or in what the president might know Paul Manafort has in his head about his own experiences on the campaign. Joining us now is Paul Fishman. He was the U.S. attorney for, the, for New Jersey for seven and a half years, overseeing multiple criminal investigations and prosecutions involving political corruption. Uh, he was fired by Mr. Trump earlier this year. Mr. Fishman, thank you very much for being here. It's nice to be back. Um, when, you read, when you read the indictment and the documents that were released about George Papadopoulos today, you sort of, seeing them from a prosecutor's point of view, what seemed most surprising or most important to you? Well, I think... One of the things that's clear is that Bob Mueller and his staff don't like the fact that they were lied to in the middle of an investigation involving national security. Hmm. And they interviewed this fellow in January, on January 27th, coincidentally, the night that Jim Comey went to the White House to have dinner with the president, I think. Um, they interviewed with him. He Papadopoulos. Papadopoulos. Yep. They interviewed Papadopoulos um, at, at great length. He obviously didn't tell them the truth. Uh, they interviewed him again with his lawyer. In February, he promised he would cooperate, said he would cooperate, didn't correct any of the statements, the statements he'd made in January. Um, and obviously, they did a lot of research and a lot of digging because they got access to his emails, his old Facebook account. If you look at the, if you look at the plea, he was interviewed for the second time by the FBI on February 16th, I think. Mm -hmm. And on February 17th, he deleted his entire Facebook account and put up a new one that had no content related to the Russians. The FBI and Bob Mueller's office obviously got that archived Facebook account and they were able to figure out exactly what he did and and in the middle of an investigation like this that is a huge mistake mm -hmm. for somebody who actually they can prove did something like that and then once they charge him right um, they, there's a long distance that there's a long period of time that elapses between when they charge him when they arrest him and charge him and when he finally pleads they describe him as proactively cooperating during that time what does that mean so two things are generally happening in that time period if that happens one is somebody's being as as law enforcement calls it completely debriefed um, they want to ask him, once he agrees to cooperate, everything he knows, everything he did himself, everything that he knows about, every person he's talked to, any information he can provide to the FBI the, and, the, and the prosecutors that relates either to the jeopardy in which he finds himself, to the stuff he's done, or to anything else he might know about. Um, and then... They have to make a decision, the prosecutors and the agents, is there an opportunity to use somebody like him proactively? Typically what that might mean is that he wears a wire and may have gone to talk to people. So it is possible, I don't know, but it is possible that since the end of July until the beginning of October, he may have had conversations with some of the people mentioned in his charges running back at them to say, hey, how about that time I asked you to meet with the Russians and you said, okay, something like that. And so people on the campaign or people who may have been involved in Trump world in some way who've had conversations with him since July 27th will know that that's a possibility. And, and there's a good chance if those conversations took place that they were recorded by the FBI. If, is there anything that we should read into the fact that the Papadopoulos information was unsealed today on the same day that the Manafort and Gates indictment was unsealed? They don't appear to have very much to do with one another than the fact that they're both Trump-related. Is, is, could that be a coincidence? Would they otherwise do these things on the same day if they weren't connected? No, I think I, it may simply be that, that Mueller and his team want to send a message that they're serious and they're making progress. Uh, it may also be the, the, the common thread between the two is that both Manafort and Gates and Papadopoulos had, were um, guilty of greatly deceptive conduct, and mm. I think that matters. One of the things that I took away from both documents, and I don't know if you noticed this when you, when you read them, is that um, th the Manafort indictment talks about the fact that the FBI had access to lots of emails through a, through a judicially approved search warrant. Mm -hmm. Papadopoulos... Uh, plea also talks about the emails that the that the just that the Mueller team had access to. So it's pretty clear that they are very aggressively using judicially authorized search warrants to get to the emails of people who may have been involved in these and other episodes. And so that's a it's it's a it's a it's an important investigative technique. It's one that prosecutors and agents like to use. And I wouldn't be surprised to see that surface again. One last question on those emails in the Papadopoulos documents. There aren't uh, there aren't names of other Trump campaign officials. Right. They're described as campaign supervisor and other sort of generic. 
terms like that. We can figure out who some of those people are because of other reporting about right. other pieces of those emails. Is there a reason why those people's names would be left out of those documents? Yeah, typically the Justice Department's policy is that if somebody has not been implicated in documents in court, either through evidentiary filings or through an indictment or through a guilty plea, it's the policy not to name those people in those kinds even of documents. Even if you can suss out who they are. Even if people can suss out who they are. Sometimes it's more obvious than in other occasions in different cases, but that's the reason for it. But, it, but if you read the motion to seal the plea mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of Papadopoulos, which took place, the plea agreement, which took place on October 5th, that motion talks about the reason that they were, the documents were sealed for the last three weeks, and that's because the FBI was trying to interview people involved in that case. It may well be that those people were people who were interviewed or that the FBI took a run at them. Paul Fishman, former U.S. attorney from the great state of New Jersey. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Thank nice you. to see you. All right, we've got more questions. <laughs> I feel like the more I understand about this, the more fired up about it I get. i got to figure this out. We'll be right back. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.